This is a special encore presentation of One on One with Jane Mitchell to celebrate Trevor Hoffman's induction into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Rewind now to 1998. In some respects with Trevor Hoffman, what you see is what you get. But it's what he usually doesn't let you see that helps explain his closer mentality, his makeup, his magnetism, as he's making his mark in the game. Trevor Hoffman could have inspired the saying, never let them see you sweat. With the game on the line, his game face is on. Sober, stoic, even as his adrenaline is pumping. So high, so high. I mean, your heart's pumping, and uh, you're, you're, you're tight, you're trying to calm down, and um, you know the lineup, you know the three guys you're, you're going to face when you go in there. And But once, you, once I get out to the, the, the main mound out there, it's like, whew, it's calm. You know, this is where I've wanted to be for the last three hours. This is where he's wanted to be his whole life. Trevor William Hoffman was born October 13, 1967, raised in Anaheim, California. I think I was a pretty happy kid, to be honest with you. I had uh, two loving parents that uh, allowed me to, to just be myself and uh, not have a lot of pressures on me. And two older brothers he craved to be with, wanted to be like. To one day beat them at something. And you know, I'm doing this at five years old, six years old. And, and all they're worried about was eliminating me from their ping pong game or the wiffle ball game. He wouldn't go off and play with his buddies. He wanted to stick around. So we'd have all these type of, you know, rules to get, get rid of him. Baseball, okay, you can hit until you strike out. One, two, three, gone. Okay, next guy, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. The competitive nature, I think, comes just from being three boys and, and growing up together and, and fighting over what's on the table to eat or uh, uh, what card game we're going to play. At just six weeks old, Trevor had a defective kidney removed, restricting him from contact sports, but not much else. His brother Greg, 13 years older, pursued high school basketball coaching and teaching special education. Glenn, 10 years older than Trevor, became a major league baseball player. While sports dominated their household, his parents' story inspired his appreciation for the arts. In 1950, Trevor's mother, Mickey, was a blossoming British ballerina. His father, Ed, an American and war veteran, was the tenor in the traveling quartet, the Royal Guards. He had a fabulous voice. They met in England, shared a stage for a command performance for the king and queen. Romance bridged a 20-year age difference. They were married 43 years before Ed Hoffman died of cancer in 1995. I think of him every day, and, it, and it's been extremely tough, uh, having gone through some of these things that I know he would have loved and uh, would love to experience. I don't think I ever heard him have a crossword with his boys. I took on the tough role. And <laughs> Their dad was always the soft spot. <laughs> Andy credits both for their influences on him, his mother's athleticism, his father's professionalism. He had that, that aura about him. He'd, he'd play the crowd. He'd build up the, the, the scene. And, you know, that has a little bit to do with uh, what we do when, when the stage is on us. Ed Hoffman's second career took him to the post office so he could be home with his family. But the entertainer in him sang the national anthem through the years at his son's Little League and Major League games as an angel singing usher. It wasn't just that he was singing, he was singing his country's national anthem and it was, uh, it was, it was awesome to watch him do it. I always got nervous though. I always got nervous he was going to forget the words. He never did. He always aced it. Hoffman family vacations followed Glenn's baseball career, so Trevor experienced Major League batting practice with the Red Sox at 13 years old. He knew this is where he wanted to be. As an infielder at Savannah High School, he had a good arm but couldn't hit for power because he was small and skinny. Coach Mike Quigley recalls what Trevor lacked in size, he made up for in determination. He just dedicated hours after practice. He would ask us to hit ground balls just to him alone. He just wanted to be better and better all the time. That mystique I had to live up to going to the same high school as my brothers and uh, you know playing the same sports that they did. Baseball and basketball. 
you know, coming through at 5'2", 110 pounds, you, you better be real good, otherwise you're, uh, you know, you're going to take a back seat. And I was just kind of an average Joe in high school. There's, there's no doubt about it. Then he grew. Well, I sprouted up another four or five inches and put on 50 pounds and actually was able to compete at a level where I needed to start proving myself. Starting at the nearby Cypress Junior College with coach Scott Pickler. So he wasn't highly recruited. You know, he was more of a basketball player. People weren't sure. Um, we saw something there that we thought was special. He hit 300 for us. He was all league for us. He went to Arizona as a shortstop. Trevor's second proving ground, two years at the University of Arizona with coach Jerry Kindle. A respectful guy courteous and a fierce, fierce competitor. But the pitching coach pleaded to use Trevor's cannon of an arm to pitch. We need him as our shortstop. We don't have anybody that can step in and play as well as Trevor at shortstop. And so I resisted that reluctantly. Shortstop Trevor Hoffman. Cincinnati drafted him out of college with what would be prophetic words on the draft sheet, shortstop slash pitcher. As an all-pack college shortstop, he was a good batter, with an aluminum bat. They take that aluminum bat out of my hand, stuck the wood bat in, and it was like, oh my gosh, it's a whole, whole new ball game. My swing wasn't adapted, uh, didn't adapt real well to, the, to that, that style of play. He struggled in rookie ball, then in single A Charleston. I never realized what Glenn had gone through to make it to the big league level. I thought it was just, you know, no big deal. Cincinnati didn't want Trevor as a shortstop, but before releasing him, offered to see what he could do on the mound. He hadn't pitched since Little League because of his father's fear of ruining a young arm. So the last two months of the season, Trevor learned mechanics. No breaking balls, no change-ups, just throw strikes. And uh, they liked what they saw and they invited me back. Now it was up to Trevor. At 23 years old, an age when a player's usually locked into his position, shifting gears was a big decision. And I said, I'm doing it. There's no way I'm not going like, to give it a shot. Work ethic was outstanding. The kid that had the game in perspective. He would come and park his little Toyota right behind the bleachers behind us and run in the outfield and throw in the pin. Spring of 91, back in the minors, pitching. I had no clue what, what to expect. As a starter, then a reliever. Sooner or later, that opportunity came where, you know, I was going to get a chance to close some ball games out for him. And, you know, I took a stranglehold of that role, and I wasn't going to give it up. And uh, things, things were a, a, a rocket ship from that point forward. While Trevor Hoffman was moving up the ranks in the Cincinnati minor league system, the Reds chose not to protect him during the 1992 expansion draft, so he was up for grabs for the new teams, Colorado and Florida. Trevor Hoffman picks up the story of how he got his major league news with his father at a neighborhood pizza parlor listening to the draft announcements on TV. Uh, the fourth pick for the Florida Marlins is... Trevor Hoffman from the Cincinnati Reds. We look at each other and we go, oh my God, we're hugging and making a ruckus. There's really nobody in there at that 12 o'clock in the afternoon. It was just like, what a special moment to, to experience that with your father. 1993, Trevor Hoffman had made it to the big leagues. Got him! And people know, recognize you, know who you are. And I'm going, this is great. Mid-season, Florida trades him to San Diego. Bummed, thoroughly bummed. The fans in, in San Diego and weren't weren't real uh, open arms to a, a young kid coming in has been unproven, especially when a, a Gary Sheffield's going the other way and they see what's happening in their club. The rookie gave up three runs his first appearance, but in 94 and 95 came of age as a pitcher with 20, then 31 saves. And in 1996? Yeah, guys like Finley and Caminini were having career years and, uh, and a guy named Hoffman was, was doing his part too. Got him with a changeup. You can't believe the variety of pitches that Trevor Hoffman has come up with. Saving 42 games, none as important as the one September 29th against the Dodgers. That's it. Curtis strikes out, and the San Diego Padres are the champs of the NL West. It's rings, it's dog piling, it's pouring champagne on each other. That's anybody cares about. A sweet memory the team wouldn't repeat in 97, although Trevor finished second in the league for saves. As for 1998, Trevor Hoffman is on fire, setting club records and tying the major league record for 41 consecutive saves. Confident and composed, he's no doubt matured since his minor league days of trying to project an image by eating bugs. I guess that's what I kind of thought the, the role entailed, was to 
be this loose cannon or this wacko guy that uh, people fear because he eats bugs or he does stupid things. This mystique that you have to develop really doesn't mean squat because people are going to get to know you and you know the only way you're going to you know, challenge people is with your stuff. His stuff is an arsenal of pitches. Boy, did you see the action on that pitch? Pitches that move all over the plate. Evolving from a tweaked shoulder in 94. My velocity was down. I wasn't the same power pitcher I was when I first came up or first even started throwing. He learned location is a better defense than just speed. Breaking ball for a strike. How about that? And he's mastered the elusive changeup. Changeup swung on and missed. One and two. Beyond his arm and his intellect, he is methodical, disciplined, even a little superstitious. I pick a hat in spring training. And, uh, you know, I run with it. It's, it's the only one I use throughout the season. That hat shows and, and signifies that uh, you've grinded it out for eight months. He grinds it out every day. You know, being in good shape, it's, it takes, you know, an effort. He arrives early to run. I do that just to kind of get my, clear my mind from what I've been doing earlier in the day. You know, I do some sit-ups and, and do some arm weights. And, and uh, get ready for batting practice. He doesn't hit or shag much, doesn't want to get hurt. At the start of the game, he's in the bullpen. It's usually pretty lighthearted. Once the, uh, the middle of the fifth comes, I take off. He walks under the stands, through the underground tunnel to the clubhouse. You can't just all of a sudden, for me anyway, just go turn a, a light switch on and go, okay, I'm locked in. It's something that takes maybe 30 minutes to you know, my quiet time, so I kind of escape from it. I, you know, I'm by myself in the locker room, and I shine my shoes and get ready for the ball game, and run in, take a shower, and let some hot water roll on my shoulder so it kind of loosens up. I just feel clean, I'm, I'm ready to go. From there, I get dressed, and I go into the training room, and I, I go through kind of what, you know, the starters go through. I'm not talking with anybody. We're, we know exactly what we're doing. We don't have to communicate when we have the TVs up. So I'm, I'm constantly in touch with the game. Once he comes back out, you know, on the, towards the bottom of the eighth, he's a totally different person. He's, you know, totally focused. I start watching the game, and I can see situations starting to develop. He's our guy. Um, if the game's on the line, if there's a safe situation out there, when that phone rings in the ninth inning, everybody in the bull bullpen knows it's Trevor. The phone rings. Toffee, you're up. I usually will take time then to tighten up my shoes tight. He warms up on the bullpen mound, picks up the rosin bag. To get a little bit of tack going so I can feel a little better with my curveball and my changeup feels comfortable with my hand. And, uh, you know, th that, that's just a, another inside of the little routine that just kind of right before you're going in the fire, this is, this is what's the last stage, the last step for. You know, I feel like I'm ready to go. What's that like, the walk to the mound? I don't think there's a, a better feeling in this game. To turn and go from the bullpen mound and start jogging towards the, the mound, it's like going in, it's it got to be something like a prize fighter, you know, like uh, a heavyweight champion going in the ring. Um, it's, it's that type of uh, mental game with, with, within yourself. You got 50,000 people or 40,000 people either for you or against you, and uh, they're screaming and yelling, so it doesn't matter where you're at. You can make it, everybody seem like they're for you with what they're yelling. But then, then, then it's time to go, and it's, and it's like, let's rock for three outs, let's go. Do you think people just have come to expect and maybe even take it for granted that when Trevor Hoffman comes in, he's going to save the game? Maybe, but I, I think that's a credit to doing my job. In my head, there, there's nothing being taken for granted. There's, there's no way that, uh, you know, I walk into the ball game and go, I got these turkeys right where I want them. You'd never know it. He never reveals if he's having a good day or a bad day. Once I see him get on that mound, I know I better, you know, crank it up and, and be ready to hit. For the past six years, I've not had any, I don't think I've gotten any hits off him. That's the ball game. After the game's victory walk on the field, Trevor sits in the dugout, his body still shaking. It's my quick little way of let's analyze what just went on. You know, let's, let's think about what you did out there. And, and then once that's over with, I'm, I'm usually waiting for um, Book and, and Stump to come give me a little bit of their love. And then we go into, go into the dugout and it's all over with and we get ready for the next day. What do you learn more from or carry around with you more when you save a game or don't? 
Good question. Um, I think you have to learn or take something from both. When you're going good and you've saved a lot of ball games, there's a good opportunity for you to get real high and big headed and you know, I'm going good and this and that. And the moment you do that, this game's gonna slam you. It's gonna slam you to the floor as hard as it can. There it goes. Alou has tied the game and cost Trevor Hoffman a chance to set a major league record. You can't slam yourself even harder than the game has because you gotta you gotta pick yourself up. You gotta have enough uh, self-confidence that uh, your stuff is good enough and that you can get them out and you're going to get them out the next time you go out there. He's the save man. He is the save man. He's a good soldier. There's a lot on that man's shoulders, and he better do his job. I think he's the difference between winning and losing. Trevor Hoffman's not just captivating fans in San Diego. Trevor Hoffman has been outstanding this year. And he has the real good fastball and the exceptional changeup. These figures presented by Trevor Hoffman are awesome. All around baseball, people are talking about Trevor Hoffman. Who wouldn't want people to know who the heck you are when you're playing a game that's uh, as well known as it is. Um, but there's a certain level where you kind of want to be the unknown. You want to be the underdog. Unless it's at his first appearance in an all-star game. What an experience that was. 40 million people in there. The reality of uh, where you were at really finally hit. While others at least cracked a smile. <laughs> My big brother goes, you smile a little bit, dude. Trevor <laughs> Hoffman. I have this long hair and it probably would have taken the hat on. the hair would have flopped over. <laughs> I had took gum out there. My mom always says don't chew gum when you're on TV and so uh, I had gum in my left hand so I wouldn't have been able to flip the hair back and I'm just going to dip my cap and go back in line. <laughs> in the stands, his wife Tracy and their sons, Brody and Quinn. He's worked so hard to get there and, and I just looked at him and said, I am so proud of you. This baseball success didn't occur to Tracy Hoffman six years ago. Trevor was in AAA and approached her while out one night in Buffalo, New York. And she said, well, I don't give up my number, but uh, you know, you can, uh, you can reach me at work, and this is where I work. He forgot her real estate office's name, but recalling she was a Buffalo Bills cheerleader, his agent tracked her down. He's interested in buying some property in the New York, Buffalo, New York area. And, you know, we'd like to get the number of where she works. And I'm thinking, all right, great, I'm going to have a sale. It took me four days to find her, but uh, fortunately we had four days up in Buffalo, and uh, you know, it, was, uh, it was well worth the effort. And he was just so funny on the phone. I mean, he was just a jokester, and he made me smile. Tracy didn't know much about baseball then. She thought the instructional league was for struggling rather than special players with potential. So when my parents asked me, you know, what does he do? Well, he used to play baseball, but I guess he was really bad. So now he's, he's done with his career. So I had no idea that he, was, um, that he was going to do as well as he did. But it's nice, though. I mean, I didn't see dollar signs when I met him, that's for sure. He proposed at the Super Bowl, and they married in 1993. You know, she's, she's fantastic. She's a beautiful woman. She's really the, the, the heart and soul and the, and the glue to the whole thing, and people don't realize it. I know baseball is going to end. I know it's not going to be there forever. So, um, and let's focus on his career and what he's doing right now, and let's achieve his goals. Give mama love and love. Not a boy. And I have so much enjoyment out of my children that um, I don't think any career could ever come close to that, fulfilling that. I like when I see my kids get up in the morning and they got a big smile on their face. Yeah, he's a good dad. He's a kid himself, so he's right there with them playing. Trevor rarely misses an opportunity for a good laugh. Okay. Where I could, I could go like this, <laughs> be like a psychiatrist. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm really scared of my job. And <laughs> oh, I wish I were an Oscar wiener. That's what I truly like to be. And while he didn't get his father's singing voice, his talents are clear. He's a three-time Padre Pitcher of the Year, the 96 Sporting News National League Fireman of the Year, and in 97 became the Padres' all-time save leader. 98 brings new dimensions. Locally, he's celebrated as one of the Padres' marquee players. Okay, right here, Trev. Cheese. Rotate cheese. Are you doing cheese? Did that have a kiss? 
snow. Nationally, he's drawn attention by tying the major league record for consecutive saves and by facing his rival team, the Dodgers, when his brother Glenn made his debut as a major league manager. Remember that day when uh, both you guys were at the stadium together and we could sit back and have a cigar and think about it and talk about it? And I'm enjoying it. And I know his dad is. <laughs> Regardless if he's up in a better place, he's, he's there with us. He's, he's at every step of the way. All right, nice to see you. Trevor Hoffman's compassionate and empathetic sides are clear as he's embraced the National Kidney Foundation and organ donation as his man, cause. You the man, you the man. <laughs> he greets young patients and donates $200 for each save, $25,000 so far for research, education, and to help organ recipients like Justin Lamantia. He always makes it so you always have a lot of hope. Thank you for being here for me and being my friend. A happy and confident Trevor Hoffman knows what bothers him. When things don't go right, you know, confusion, confusion adds to more confusion. And it, uh, I, get, I get a little stressed out about that stuff. There's no doubt about it. And I, I, I have a hard time dealing with it. One place he seeks relief. This is so beautiful. Is the ocean. And the sun's just starting to go down and it's lighting up the sky. There's nothing like that that puts me in a good mood. There's nothing better. There's nothing better than watching Mother Nature show her, her glory. See the lone sail ship in the middle of the sun down there. You see that? After his playing days, with no concern for an arm injury, he'll try surfing, maybe even auto racing. He has a sense of adventure and a sense of security in San Diego, signed through 1999, and now settling into a new home with a pool table and wall art by Brody. It's not just about money and, um, and, and cars and stuff. It's about having good health and having two beautiful baby boys. These are the days. I, uh, I would have to have a strong faith in God. I have achieved everything I have achieved and Trevor for the same reason, because of him. Trevor Hoffman's code of armor, code of ethics, and competitive nature are rooted in his upbringing and have matured with marriage, fatherhood, and his career, while a World Series ring would be the pinnacle. When it's all said and done, to look back upon a career and say, I was, you know, we were, we were pretty good, I was pretty good, and I helped uh, a club be good for a long time. I mean, he's flat out the best in the game. You know, I haven't seen anybody like him. Those games, if they get away, man, that changes the psyche of the club. So to have the consistency and the uh, of Trevor is is huge for this team. He's always motivating, always talking about trying to you know drag that extra little bit out of players. He's always willing to help, always willing to offer a little bit. I enjoy doing what I do. I enjoy being the closer for the San Diego Padres. I know that, and uh, you know the other stuff is is gravy. You know, as far as the fame and and things like that. It, 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 it strokes your ego again, but again, you, you got to be well grounded. You got to understand where you came from. He understands and remembers being that little boy who worked to excel in sports like his two big brothers. He just reinvents himself, and he's just one of those guys that's a, not only a survivor, but he goes that above and beyond. Trevor Hoffman understands what it takes to achieve. So if the eyes are the window to the soul, what does he hope others will see when they look into his eyes? That a guy that's going to give 100%, that uh, when he's been given a task to do, that he's going to do it uh, wholeheartedly. And you know, you're, you're not going to have to worry about if uh, he really was doing his best. While Trevor Hoffman is brilliant at slamming the door on the opposition and saving games, he can also open our eyes to what energy, effort, and enthusiasm for one's profession and for life can bring. Not bad for that skinny little kid who was always the underdog. Not bad for a guy who's always known where he wanted to be. This special presentation of One on One with Jane Mitchell was brought to you in part by Cox Communications and made possible by a generous grant from Becky Morse.